Well, uh, welcome, welcome to the on-air broadcast of uh, episode 28 of the Film Parlay. Um, we're going to actually start the show here, which we're recording GarageBand shortly. But if you are listening to this uh, on YouTube, congratulations! <laughs> yeah, uh, this will in. be completely. This will be completely unedited, um, and uh, which of course we edit the the show that goes out as a podcast. Um, Mike, are you ready to get going here? I'm ready to roll. All right, I'm gonna hit record. Actually, hang on. Let me uh, find the remote and turn down the TV. Hang on. Yeah, do that. I should probably put pants on. Are you ready? Fast, I gotta poop. Oh, are you kidding me? <laughs> um, All right, actually, by, yeah, why don't we just do the, the show and then immediately record a B side of Game of Thrones? You want to do that? Yeah, and we'll try to keep the show, you know, uh, at Jump a nice. Along. Yeah, and then and then we'll do a Game of Thrones thing. Okay. Cool. Come down. All right, I'm hit. Rec- Hit record. I'm I'm recording. I'm rolling too. Okay, let's uh, sink in three, two, one. Well, I got the feedback thing, so that's got to be good. Feedback one. I don't know what that means. Oh, okay. All right, well, I suppose that's close enough. Uh, All right, are we ready to go? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we are. I think so. All right. Uh, okay, let me pull up this a little bit, and here we go. Hello, and welcome to the 28th episode of The Film Parlay, a conversational podcast about movies and and things, things that are related to movies. My name is Tim Dennison. I'm Mike Laswell. And on this 28th episode, we are discussing Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson's latest collaboration, The Internship, directed by uh, Sean Levy, I believe. Also, in honor of Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson's reunion, uh, them, of course, uh, having both been in the pretty funny Wedding Crashers, uh, Mike and I will be talking about some of our favorite film duos from film history in our homework section. Or at least in part of our homework section, because Mike had two assignments this week. Uh, the other being that he had to go see Fast and Furious 6 on account of him being so sure it would be an utter train wreck piece of garbage. So we'll be hearing back from him on that as well. And then we'll also yeah, have will. a couple of news. <laughs> I hope so. I can't, I can't wait to hear <laughs> whether or not it fulfilled your expectations or subverted them. Uh, we'll also have a couple of bits of news. And catch up on anything of note uh, that we've uh, seen lately on the tube or in the theater. Uh, so it's a full show as usual. Mike, how are yeah. you? I'm doing well. Doing well. I've been pretty busy. But I did get a chance to get out and see both of the films that we were talking about. So Excellent. That was good. How about which, you? How are you doing? Which is, which is much better than when you see none of the films we're talking about but well, have to act like one. you have. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. it's really nice of you to forward me your notes on that, so I can kind of cheat. Right. Yeah, and and read half of what I have to say. Exactly. Right. It's tough splitting my thoughts in in into multiple parts like that. You do it well, though. Myself. Well, I kind of just do it automatically. I have a gigantic argument with myself, <laughs> uh, or 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 just write a whole bunch of myself agreeing with myself, and then uh, of course send send half of it over to you. Is that what happened with you and? Uh... The whole 24 debacle with Jelani? With Jelani. See, that's what happens when I don't do it. Okay. When I let someone else think for themselves, <laughs> they end up saying stupid things like 24 was good all the way through season eight. <laughs> uh, Did he? Has um, he heard all right. about that? 
<clears throat> I have. He, there's been no comment on surrogate apologies from Jelani okay. uh, yet, so I'm <laughs> curious to see if he'll ring in. If you're new to the show, Jelani Memory is a co-founder of the show and one of the hosts, um, but uh, isn't able to appear on every show, so we've started taking him to task for that. <laughs> uh, Mike, in answer of your question, I'm I'm doing just fine, though. Um, as uh, will become apparent throughout the show, I am uh, still battling the cough that I've had now for no five, five, five weeks. Yeah, just wow. this constant sort of liquid tickle in my uh, yeah. in my chest. So like a dry, unproductive <gasps> cough. There's nothing worse. Yeah, well, it's in. Yeah, it's in and out. Sometimes productive, sometimes dry. Uh, it is what oh. it is. So Sorry, uh, to on to our first segment, Mike. Uh, a little segment we like to call, uh, what are you drinking? Uh, well, I'm, I'm keeping it simple tonight. I went with Crown on the Rocks. Oh. Yeah. Ooh. And I went with nice. like three shots. So <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was the, it was what was left in the little bottle that I had. And I was kind of pouring. And I was like, that's not a quite enough. Well, that's all of it. Okay. <laughs> well, well we Hello. <laughs> All right. So well, what, I was, about, what about you, Tim? What do you got? Um, I have made myself a bourbon old-fashioned with Maker's Mark, um, although I, short of the orange because uh, we don't have any orange in the house, which is unfortunate. And I, w- I, I I'm actually drinking only sixty-seven percent of what you you were drinking. Um, <laughs> mine's only a double. Mine's a double tonight. Okay. Uh, but uh, that's uh, that's it's a that's a tall drink for me. So seriously, um, that's like, we'll see. That's we'll see where we're at. For us. Right there, because <laughs> three shots for me is, is a, isn't very much. Right, considering the the what shall we say, <laughs> the abject body mass. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> uh, yeah, you're a, you're a um, a large fella. I'm a stout fella, and I can well, hold my liquor. You, you can. Have we talked about your your bachelor party and your thirteen drinks? I think we have actually covered that. I think there was one. Before. I forget what it was. It, I'm worried that it was in the Oscars episode and nobody's heard it. Oh, right. But I'm that, simultaneously relieved that nobody's heard it. <laughs> well, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the internship podcast, so probably no one will hear this one either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, that concludes our segment of <laughs> What Are You Drinking? <laughs> On to news. Uh, Mike, I've got a, a, a few little bits of news. Um, do you have anything that uh, you have found of interest you want to share before I throw that throw down over here? Um, nothing huge, uh, other than okay. oh yeah, Superman opens next week. Man right. of Steel, so that, right? That's a big deal for big you. Big deal. Yeah. Uh, as is, I, I imagine, quite uh, you know, a sizable percentage of the population is looking forward to that film. Exactly. Uh, it was a Friday release on the 14th. A um, little bit of trivia here. Mike, for the longest time, drove around a... Uh, what, it was a what, 1990 what? Jeep Cherokee 90. Laredo, and it was baby blue. It was Okay, I was going to ask you what shade of blue uh, that, that beast was. A um, couple of interesting things about the uh, baby blue Cherokee that Mike used to drive around. One, uh, he named it, quote, my ass, exactly. so that he could, uh, when upon arriving somewhere or telling the story of having driven somewhere, he could always say, yeah, I drove my ass up to the mall, and so on and so forth. Exactly. Um, which I, I thought was pretty clever. Um, and my ass, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my ass featured um, a a gigantic Superman emblem on the hood that Mike hand painted uh, himself, and it went the width of the hood uh, and fit rather perfectly. <laughs> yeah, it was that. beautiful. What, what happened to my ass? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't speak for years, but. Um... We had. Uh, I, I mean, the proper no, yeah. my ass, the name. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I got I I got it when I was eighteen or so, uh, which is a long time ago now. But I got in trouble for painting that because my my folks were out of town and came back and I had painted this monstrosity on my car and I was like, "Are you kidding me? This is the coolest thing ever! Everybody's gonna <laughs> yes, love is. this." Yeah. My my folks were just. I mean, they couldn't comprehend why anyone would do that. <clears throat> so. I drove around for several years. It kind of became fainted and faint, faded, and uh, chipped a little bit. And 
um, when I went to sell it, because we have we have children now, and there's just no way you could fit the kids in that thing, so uh, we right, ended up right, selling right. it. And uh, okay. it was because of the custom painted Superman on there that that thing retained <laughs> any value. They were like, "What? Look at that! That's a." Awesome. I can't believe you painted that. Oh man, I can't wait to drive this around town. <laughs> so Exactly. So your parents yeah, were take morons. That older take generation. That mom and dad Ugh. From Las Wells. I can't can't um, think about that right now. Okay. Well uh great. Yeah, How did we get all oh right, because Superman, okay. Yeah. Well, um, it's a big deal. We right. love Superman. Well, We'll come back to Superman. So yeah, Mike is a big Superman, uh, big big Superman guy. Um, we'll come back to Superman uh, shortly. A couple of interesting little bits of news here. Uh, recently announced that Christoph Waltz of uh, yeah. Django Unchained and uh, Inglourious Bastards uh, has signed on to star in a film called True Crimes, uh, which is oddly a true story based on a New Yorker article from 2008 about a Polish writer named Christian Bala who was a uh, who was convicted of murder. Now, the murder was a cold case uh, that had been unsolved hmm. for years um, but was reopened by a detective played by Christoph Waltz. When the real uh, Christian Bala, who is an author, published a book in which a murder is committed that is very similar to the real unsolved murder and the cop that reopens the case is uh, as he reopens it and starts investigating he's sucked into an underworld of sex and drugs and so uh, pretty much we've got an update of uh, basic instinct here uh, with the, wow. you know with with your author uh, writing about the mur murders that they are in fact uh, enacting but um, it was kind of called the perfect crime and only found out because um, because the guy wrote about it, wrote about it, and was eventually convicted. So, Christoph Waltz, very interesting actor, and it sounds like a, like an interesting story. Sure, I All mean, right. reinventing Basic Instinct, maybe a little classier this time. There are some similarities there. Uh, whether or not uh, Sharon Stone's cooch makes an appearance uh, <laughs> is yet undetermined. Um. Mike, does the name? Ah, man, I'm gonna struggle with the uh, with one of the names here. Uh, but Takashi uh, Mike Takashi yeah. sound familiar? Yeah. So, director of Thirteen Assassins, which I believe you have mentioned, uh, you Maybe rather enjoy. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, it was one of my favorites of his. He started doing some period samurai pieces, and uh, <clears throat> he's kind of got a very interesting style and flair. Uh, he likes to do things that are a little bit more um, fantastical, mm -hmm. usually, and this was much more subdued for him. But it kind of harkened back to some of the, uh, you know, the '60s samurai genre with Kurosawa and, and uh, uh, things along those lines. And he did a okay. phenomenal job. It's a great one, great movie. Cool. I still haven't checked it out, but uh, I intend to. Um, Takashi is uh, actually making his first English language film. Oh, okay. Uh, it's going to be called called The Outsider. It's about a former American GI who becomes part of the Yakuza in post World War II Japan. No way. And the reason this was uh, floating to the top of the news heap uh, tonight is uh, that it's just been announced that Tom Hardy will star as that American oh, GI. Okay, that would be cool. So, yeah, I'm excited to see. Uh, uh, see Takashi move into English language, and I'm always excited to see what Tom Hardy's been doing. Yeah, have you um, seen any of the Takashi Miike stuff, earlier stuff? I have not. Yeah, I just know. I yeah, yeah he, he does some pretty hard stuff. And, oh, is that right? Yeah. I'm okay. trying to let me jump over and see what I what I. Yeah, so Ichi the Killer audition. Uh, anybody, oh shoot! You know, he did yeah. audition. Yeah, and uh, oh. each of the killer, what kind of was the predecessor for? Not not that they're related, but like kind of put him on the map as being just over the top and uh, relentless as far as some of the graphic things that he puts on film. And audition um, kind of sealed it. Have you seen audition? No, I <clears throat> I haven't seen either one of those. Um, I saw. 
I want to, I can't remember the titles escaping me. Um, if I, if it comes back, I'll, I'll jump on it. But I did see a couple, uh, that he had done earlier and, and they were, uh, pretty relentless. Um, and then audition, uh, came to mind and I asked a, a couple people about it and they were like, it is hardcore. So I, I said, okay, well maybe I'll skip that one. Yeah. I was listening to, well, the first time I had heard about audition was when I was watching, um, you know, like a VH one or an MTV, like list of 30 scariest movies or something like that. And, and audition came in at number eight, I think it was. And yeah. they had Rob zombie talking about watching it. And, um, and just freaking out, like it was. It was one of the scariest, most disturbing things he had ever seen. And this is, you know, Rob Zombie. Right. Um, so I, it, they showed a couple of clips, and it looked anyway. It looked kind of intriguing. I kind of don't want to know uh, what happens. Just <laughs> they, they showed enough to say, okay, yeah, that could get really gross. Um, but the second time I heard it was uh, I was listening to a podcast. Um, it, the nerdist the nerdist writers panel um ben blacker interviews uh television writers and okay. um he was interviewing um uh, a writer named i want to say her name is leslie headland um and she she had worked on a show called Terriers, which I, I think I've mentioned on the parley before. Um, it's on Netflix. It's only one season long. It's 13 episodes. It's got Donald Logue uh, in it, and it's really strong. Um, it's a oh, okay. really fun Southern California private detective, like, you know, former cop, alcoholic, like just updated beach bum private detective uh series anyway it's it's really good and she wrote on the series and she was telling a story about uh going out uh, the one time she's had a i think a blind date um and they went out to grab a movie at a uh, kind of an iconic uh, oh, los no. angeles uh theater and they were showing audition they went and saw it oh, and it was no. like they went they saw the movie and they walked out and they just stood there for two minutes in silence and then turned to each other and they both just said um well i don't think this is gonna work out we'll see ya yeah, like they just, it was just like we, yeah, yeah, it was so disturbing that they couldn't, they just couldn't even remain in each other's presence. Like, yeah. So, um, yeah. I, it, you know what, when there's that kind of buzz behind something, I am intrigued, but I also don't want certain things running around my head. So it's interesting yeah, that uh, exactly. he's kind of toning things. It sounds like he toned things down for 13 Assassins. And uh, if Tom yeah, Hardy's going to be in yeah. a film, I mean, he's probably not going to be doing anything too over the top. I wouldn't imagine. I mean, <clears throat> he's kind of, with 13 Assassins, he's become a little bit more mainstream. Um, and Harakira followed that, uh, which is, or Harakiri, I guess, is how you say that. I'm not an expert. At not Harry, it's not like Harry Carey, like suicide, like Japanese Harry Carey. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, okay. And it's all about this, at least that's it's how called I the death of a it. samurai. And it's supposed to be really, um, it's supposed to be kind of like memento in that it kind of follows a story backwards as a samurai approaches a castle to commit suicide, hmm. you f find out more and more about the story of why he's there. And it's this like murder and intrigue and all this stuff that's led him there. Um, <clears throat> but he did both of those. The, the one that I had come across early on was called the Sukiyaki Western Django, which was like a punk ripoff of uh, um, Yojimbo. Okay. And <laughs> it's it's super stylized and, and uh uh he he made all of the actors learn American vernacular mm -hmm. and speak English in terrible English. Like <laughs> for the just to hit on that kind of spaghetti western that um um Fistful of Dollars uh is it fist, yeah, Fistful of Dollars comes out and is a spaghetti western based on Yojimbo and it's his take on homage to that. So anyway, long story short, um, I caught 13 assassins and, and I was talking with a friend of mine and he mentioned, Oh yeah, you like him. You should check out, um, audition. And I said, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about that? Cause yeah. this guy had recommended, uh, sympathy for Mr. Vent, the whole Ven oh, Vengeance geez. trilogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Old boy and whatnot. And uh, yeah. old boy was, uh, I mean, if if you watch Old Boy and you don't cringe, uh, you would probably be somebody who's already seen Audition. So, yeah, yeah. I've I've kind of got some. There there are a few lines that I don't cross. 
Um, mm-hmm. They're not, there, there are a few, uh, there's not a lot, but there, there's still a few that I has, you know, haven't seen. And so. auditions on the other side of that line. Yeah. Audition. And then, uh, Antichrist. I just can't bring myself to see that. <laughs> right. And the Marquis right. de Sade. I think those are the top three on that, on the other side of that line. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So there you uh, go. Great. So, uh, moving on to something, uh, less meaty. Um, <laughs> well, I thought we'd, we'd make it two weeks in a row that we talked about the Expendables franchise, uh, because, you know, we worth also talked, well, right. Uh, we also <laughs> talked about last week, well, joked about how we don't, uh, we don't say anything on the parlay until it's confirmed, uh, news, <laughs> right. and which we, was a complete lie. Um, and so, in that vein, uh, rumor is that Mel Gibson will play the villain in Expendables three. Uh, so oh yeah, he still I had has heard a career, that. Uh, despite uh, multiple uh, right. infractions of just basic decent human code. Um, <laughs> and we'll see. I think, yeah, I think this is America's way of punishing him. You know, <laughs> we, we get to see him get totally dismantled in the Expendables, and we're all going to be like, yeah. Now you can have your career back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Last little thing. Um, not so much uh, about uh, movies being made, but I ran across an interesting article, or rather report, of a Google study uh, that Google released um, that says that essentially uh, by analyzing the searches that people are performing for movie trailers... Uh, and combining that with the prevalence of a franchise on the internet, they can predict the potential box office of any movie with up to 94% accuracy. Google. Yeah. What a great tie-in for the movie tonight. <laughs> wow, you're right. Uh, so I thought it was a couple of interesting statements here. Um, the first one being that the decision to see a movie is very highly considered a very highly considered research process on average. This is, Mike, uh, how yeah. many sources would you guess a moviegoer might, uh, the average moviegoer might consult before making a decision on what film to see uh, on, on the weekend? How many? You're talking how many, consciously or subconsciously? Well, I, I think trackably. So this would be <laughs> okay. like, you know, yeah. It was ironic. My question was ironic. Well, stop that because that doesn't have any place in, in the uh, internship uh, podcast. Um, wow. I would say probably I'm going to give you a ballpark, uh, a range between 15 and how, what, 20. What? Wait, how many? That's weird. That's strange to me. How many pl- places do you consult? How many reviews do you read uh, you know, and so on and so forth before you decide whether you're going to go see a movie? The, the film parlay, t- you know, take take that out of, of, of the question. Sure. Um, um, like, aside, so aside from the assignments is what you're saying? Take exactly. That yeah, like you and Lisa are going out for a night and, you know, do you, do you look up 15 different locations to see? No. That's ridiculous. No. But yeah. I'm also Consult. I don't I don't have my my phone is not blinged out to be a Twitter feed like mm-hmm. a lot of people are. So I assume like some of the some of those kind of things and and uh, you know if you're if you are a Facebook fan of like oh, Rotten Tomatoes or iTunes trailers or uh, or Apple <laughs> trailers or anything, um, you know you probably have access to at least fifteen easily. So that was that was kind of my thought. I, I, okay. I mean, I guess I don't know. I don't know what sources count for. So on average, right, it's 13, right. 13 sources. For me, it's one. Like it's Rotten Tomatoes, which granted is sort of aggregate. But like, how many people are spending time going to thirteen different locations to figure out whether they want to go see a movie or not? That just seemed really inflated to me. Yeah, uh, and see, that's why. I was kind of asking, like, subconsciously or consciously, because if you just go and peruse trailers. That's that's one thing, but if you just go to thirteen different sites saying, "I want to find out everything each one of these sites has to say about the Great Gatsby," I would I wouldn't believe people do that. You right. know what I mean? Like I don't think they intentionally go to thirteen different sites. Okay, fair so, enough. Yeah, um, I think they probably consult thirteen, but it's not in, you know intentional necessarily. You know what I mean? I think they have access or they're bombarded with. So okay. 
All right, fair enough. Uh, a couple of specifics um, in the Google formula. It says that uh, in the seven-day window prior to a film's release date, if a film receives 250,000 search queries more than a similar film, then the film with more quer queries is likely to perform up to $4.3 million better during opening weekend. And then when looking at uh, pay-per-click ad that's interesting. Vol volume. If a film has 20,000 more pay clicks than a similar film, is expected to bring in up to 7.5 million more during opening weekend. So, I, anyway, I thought, I thought that was interesting. Um, they also say that 48% of moviegoers decide what film to watch the day they purchase their ticket. Um, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah, which is why, like, I'm, I'm surprised that. I, I don't know. Maybe it's the way they phrase it. Moviegoers consult 13 sources before they make a decision. Well, if I'm making that decision on the day of and probably after work the day of, am I really going to consult 13 sources between the time I get off of oh, work yeah, no, and end up no, no, in the no. theater? I mean, maybe I'm, I don't know. It just seemed, it seemed a little bit weird. But like you say, maybe they're considering those sources uh, um, more broadly uh, than I am. All right, let's get off of Google because we're going to spend more time with Google uh, a little bit a little bit later. Um, so news. Oh, hold on, let me do another. Uh, let me do another transition out of there. Oh, okay. Um, <coughs> so <let's, laughs> okay. So let's uh, let's move on from Google, but stick with predictions. Um, I have I have no idea mm. what the what the search statistics are for Man of Steel, but that's the big opener next weekend. Mike, I thought we'd play a little game uh, where we predict the uh, opening weekend box office for Man of wow. Steel. Uh, so the question is, how much will Man of Steel make this coming weekend domestically? Okay, uh, for reference, just a f a few recent uh, big. Uh, comic book hero films. Uh, Iron Man three did 175 million in its opening weekend. Oh, it was, wow. That was a Friday opening. Dark Knight Rises did 161 million uh, on, I believe, a Friday opening. And the Avengers did 207 million uh, again on a Friday opening. So no, that's do, that's domestic. Uh, so those are huge numbers. And my question to you. Uh, is go on the record. What do you think Man of Steel is going to bring in uh, opening opening weekend? Well, I'm going to round it out and say <clears throat> I'm going to say a hundred. Uh, you know what? I'm going to say 150. Okay, 150 million. million. Okay, yeah, so that's that kind seems of a safe. Cool. I think a lot of people are probably going, yeah, of course, 150 million, and probably wishing they could punch me in the nuts and say, you know, <laughs> give me a specific. But here's the deal. Well, that is specific. It's just 150. Well, Right, but it's not like, um, you know, like... It doesn't uh, end Star in an Trek odd is, number. Right, Star Trek is 182, so, um, yeah, you know what, I'll, I'll push it and I'll say 170. We'll say 170. So you're going to stay round, but you're going to go to 170. 173. So, so I'm come in... Closest without going over. This is Price is Right rules. <laughs> okay, so, uh, all right, well, I wrote mine down before I asked the question. Um, I love how you just changed it three times and grew by... 23 million um, so just under Iron Man 3 and well above Dark Knight Rises um, I, I put mine in I, I feel like I'm on the high side uh, I don't know why but uh, I'm, I'm saying 163 we both ended oh, up okay. with 3 yeah okay. so yeah um, we'll go closest and uh, um, you know if, if we're both over then, then I win because yeah, I'll be the lowest. <laughs> you turd. It's like bidding one one dollar. <laughs> right? It's going to do one dollar. What's the prize? What do I win oh, if I win? <laughs> um, yeah, we should, we should figure that out. Um, okay. Yeah, and, well. Uh, shoot, we only got a couple of days. Uh, let's think of something before the end of the show. All right, whatever. The, we'll see what that prize is. Um, all right, that's the end of news and predictions. <laughs> Our new segment called News and Predictions, uh, <laughs> which are related. Yeah have you have you seen anything of note lately that you want to bring up? That's uh, not the the theater films that we've been talking about. Well, uh, as far as on or TV, we'll be talking about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, as far as on TV, I was lucky enough. Um, you know you few and far between are the times when you sit down and the stars have aligned 
and you get to see a movie of just uh, the utmost caliber. Um, but I was able to, especially considering the movies that are coming up and you have assigned uh, for homework. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I turned on the TV and I was flipping through and thank the Lord um, the that FX was broadcasting too fast, too furious. <laughs> because <laughs> there was no way on earth I was going to rent anything from that franchise uh, before seeing mm-hmm. Fast 6. And so... <laughs> Mm-hmm. Um, I was able to watch Too Fast, Too Furious, but I'll talk about all of the Fast and Furious franchise and and my uh, uh, radical catharsis that, that that came about this homework assignment uh, later. Okay, well, homework is uh, is coming up. Um, sure, but uh, a couple of things uh, besides that. Well, first of all, I think we're both. Now, wait a. Wait yeah. a second. Are you uh, are you watching Game of Thrones? Uh, we watched the first two seasons. We we're not uh, yet on this one. Okay, that's right. We talked about this. You're gonna you're yeah. gonna uh, rent them or do yeah, something and one. knock yeah. them all out at once. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, you're watching though, right? I I am, in fact, and and, and you're uh, current, right? I am, and there was uh, somewhat of a controversial. Uh, episode, uh, the latest episode. Of course, by the time the the uh, this parlay is published, the the season finale uh, will have played. Um, but right now, the ninth episode is the most recent. And um, you know what? It's worth it's worth a little bit of a discussion. So how about we table that and do a B side uh, with Game of Thrones uh, Ooh, because be I've got. Yeah, I've got some some things to, because now, of course, you're only through season two, but your wife has read all the way through the third book, which goes beyond season three uh, of the television series. Right. And so why you that's actually important know, is because I picked her brain about it because I told her right. I wasn't going to read it, and uh, right. And so you, you asked. We have we have shared knowledge on that, so uh, I was aware. Right. Prior so you are you, premiere. you are fully aware of what has happened through season or episode nine, and in fact, Indeed. probably uh, what will happen in most of season four, which takes place over the second half of the third book. Um, so even though Mike hasn't seen the show, he's aware of the events, and we're going to talk about some of those story elements um, in a B side. So look for yeah, that. Now, uh, real shortly. quick, just for yeah. our listeners now, just. What was your reaction? You saw the episode. Tell me. Tell me just a little bit about it. Give me something. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Well, uh, the subtitle uh, for <laughs> Game of Thrones, particularly after this episode, could be something along the lines of, uh, you know, Game of Thrones systematically removing any reason to watch this series whatsoever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I mean, I, I say that um, sort of tongue-in-cheek because I, I will continue watching it. it. They they are making some crazy decisions based on, of course, uh, the book. Um, and they feel really crazy right now because we don't know where the overall story is going to go. Um, but they're really, really frustrating because they're not the kinds of things that you would normally do uh, in a series. And um, I mean, it's what it's what's frustrating is that you know normally for a a series you latch on to one or two characters that you kind of project onto yourself onto and kind of experience the the whole story through them. Um, for like in Lost, for me that was that was Jack. Like other people identified with Locke, um, well, or Kate, yeah. or even Sawyer. For for me, it was Jack. I mean, he's flawed, but there was still something that you, uh, or particularly that that I could identify with, and and he was my anchor for that whole series. Right. Um, if 
if he had been eliminated um, after having been intentionally set up as an anchor, um, that would have been very frustrating for me because he's clearly somebody that that they're offering up as an anchor. Um, and with Game of Thrones, they offer up people as anchors and then kill them. And that's right. an interesting choice because... Uh, because then your audience no longer has an anchor. <laughs> um, right, right. And uh, we'll get into more detail on that in the B-side because uh, um, I need to process yeah. some of that stuff out loud with you. Um, okay. Really briefly, what I have been watching, uh, what I just got finished watching actually with my son tonight, we went ahead and threw in the Blu-ray for Jurassic Park 3. <laughs> oh, um, really? Which I've seen uh, prior to tonight, I've seen one and like, a fifth times because I saw it I, th I think in the theater and thought oh man that was kind of fun and then we bought the DVD uh, when my wife and I were young marrieds uh, bought the DVD and eventually threw it in to watch it and got about 20 minutes in uh, before we're like oh my gosh this is terrible uh, so it's <laughs> been it's been 10 years plus uh, something like that uh, since okay. we've since we've seen it um, and I just thought, you know, let's watch. It's gonna be big. It's gonna be loud. Let's give it a shot. And right. you know, what? if you can get, he's been on the whole Jurassic Park like ride. Like I, I don't mean like the ride right. in, in Florida, but I mean he's right. getting into Jurassic Park. He's seen the first one, and he's kind of progressing through. Right. All well, of the and we, and I took him to Jurassic Park 3D in the in the theater, and uh, which was, <coughs> excuse me, a really wonderful experience. And um. Yeah, so he's into it, and we skipped two because two's not very good, and I had seen some of it recently, and I just didn't want to watch it over again oh, okay. um, for the sake of continuity with him. So we just jumped into three, which is fine because it doesn't really... And there's a couple of in-jokes, um, but by and large, it's it's just it's a standalone movie. And uh, it's... <coughs> excuse me. Uh, it was What'd actually okay. It was okay. It was okay this time. If you can get through the first 20, 25 minutes and the definitely increased comedic tone, um, like cheap cheap laughs, if, if, if you can just be prepared for that and go in, the special effects are improved over the first two films and um, if you've got a killer sound system, as I do, uh, it sounds great. And it's it's a little bit of fun. You're not really invested in the characters. They're 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 pretty cliched and, and cookie cutter. But but it's got uh, Alan Grant back from the first right, film, and right. and uh, it's fine. It's fine. It's just it's fun adventure. You see a lot of dinosaurs. Um, right. But <laughs> it's definitely less. It goes for less of the um, like beauty and awe factor of the first film, and much more like. Anytime we see a dinosaur, let's just have it put you in danger right away. Right, um, <laughs> right. That was that would be my biggest critique of the whole thing, is that yeah. it just seems like all of the dinosaurs are. I mean, it's almost like a monster movie that at that level because yeah, it's just that dinosaurs are just out to get you. Right. Pretty much, it, and it doesn't matter their species or their uh, eating habits. <laughs> they just, if you're there, they're gonna get you. Yeah, uh, it's definitely going for that action movie, monster movie element. And, you know, there's a couple of moments where you, you see some herbivores walk across the screen or they fly over and you see a, herds moving and they try to do, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they try to do the, the beauty moment, but they do it really, really quickly. Even John Williams' right. score, like his themes are sped up. Because they just don't have the really? patience for it, which is kind of <laughs> stupid. But yeah, it's see, still big and loud and fun. Yeah. So and it's dinosaurs, you know. And it's for me, right. whatever whatever happens during the year, uh, like whatever is released, <laughs> kind of fade into the background around the end of May and early June. And I'm like, you know what? I have a hankering to watch is Jurassic right. Park. Always, um, always. <clears throat> yeah, and to, on, honestly, I I would say that the second one is of the of the latter two uh that we're talking about the second one is is i prefer that one far yeah. above yeah yeah well, i mean that, the the whole trailer sequence with the dinosaurs is so reminiscent of the first one and that it yes. for me it's uh it's just worth 
I mean, especially if you're just renting it for a buck or whatever, if you catch it on TV, man, <clears throat> or especially if you have the sweet Blu-ray and a sweet sound system. Right. I'd rather it's, check that one out anyway. It's cool, but the Malcolm's daughter is yeah, stupid, that's, and uh, that's hard. I, the whole it's out, honestly, it's it's kind of like the twister of Jurassic Park films. They have you know the the <laughs> scientists who are just in it for the money, going down to trap dinosaurs and bring them back to a park. And uh, <coughs> man, I'm struggling. Uh, it, it, it's it's stupid in in a way, and I, I mean like the dinosaur part is cool, but like all the human interaction is kind of silly, except for Vince Vaughn, isn't it? Hey, connection hey. to the show today. Way to go! <coughs> all right, so the other thing I've been watching just started the AMC series. I believe it's AMC, The Killing. Uh, this is the one that you know has the the tagline "Who killed Rosie Larson?" And I'm two episodes in. And it is freaking fantastic. Really? Uh, oh my gosh. It is, it's amazing. And it's one to be like, I know you cancel Blockbuster, Mike. Good job. Welcome <laughs> to the 20th century. You need to spend the eight ninety nine, get Netflix streaming, and start watching the show. Um, it's a police procedural, uh, but it is, it's one case for mm. the entire season. Uh, and shall we say at least the entire first season? Um, and it is, it's set in Seattle. It's moody. It's a remake of a Danish uh, television show inspired by the Danish television show, and uh, it just has a, a very specific feel. Um, and it's paying close. It's paying attention to both the procedural side as well as the emotional. Uh, turmoil the the family and the community is going through. I cried during the in the pilot. Like this is a police procedural. Think you know CSI Miami. Right, think right. Special Victims Unit of whatever god awful CBS show. Like and <laughs> right. and think yeah, about yeah. think about them doing a, you know a cop show that evokes strong emotion from you. Like this is this is doing it now. They're doing it differently and they're doing it right. Um, and it's not schlocky and it's not crap. It's it's really, really good. And Jelani's been singing his praises for a long time, and I finally just got on the stick. So there it is. Uh, the Killing and Jurassic Park 3, uh, the must-see of the two of those is uh, The Killing. Let's move on <laughs> to uh, our homework. Mike, before we get to uh, our film duos, why don't you report back? You were very critical of Fast and the Furious uh, 6. Just look at the trailers. It looks stupid. Right. Uh, and uh, you mentioned that before you went out and saw Fast 6, Too Fast and Too Fierce was on the television, so you were able to kind of update yourself w with a little bit, at least of the roots of the franchise. Uh, right, what right. are your overall thoughts on, on what you saw? Right, so first of all, let's just remember <laughs> what the franchise is. Um, <clears throat> uh, Fast and the Furious started off as, as a way for uh, people to build a story around showboating their cars. Um, you have these incredible machines um, and, you, and you just get to watch these people do these fantastic races and, and, and they kind of got around the whole uh, cop thing by saying, uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah these guys are going to do these races and it's going to be huge and it's going to be sexy and there's going to be a ton of people there. Well, how come the cops don't show up? I got it. What if one of them was a cop? Right? So you have... Uh, that kind of mentality going into it. It's just, it's just for the show of the car. Um, the one that I had seen, and I, I'm not sure if I've seen the first one, so <laughs> I'm not going to really uh, touch on that. <clears throat> However, I'm relatively certain that I did go to it, uh, but I will, uh, I will admit that even during this outing, I did fall asleep oh, no. during the viewing. Um, of one of the films. I'll get into that in a minute. But um, so I got to touch uh, touch up a little bit on the the uh, the canon with Too Fast, Too Furious, and let me just uh, jump back and we'll we'll talk about the the places and and how uh, how America has viewed and, and their critical reception of this series so far. Because uh, <clears throat> I, I really did my homework on this, Tim. I want you to understand. I didn't just go <laughs> see these and, and report back on how I feel. 
So the first one came out in 2001. So this is a series that has spanned over a decade. This is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big, it's, it's a big show and it likes to wield it. Okay. Sure. Uh, it came out in 2001 and it garnered a 53% Rotten Tomatoes, which is not great, but it's not, it's, it's not, not terrible. Worst. Yeah. Right. And if you're making mistakes with the first one, let's make a second one and we can fix some of that stuff and at least get 60. I would well, expect two, that to go down to 37. Right. Too Fast, Too Furious got 36 and it came <laughs> out two years later. 36%. You just, yeah, you totally cut. called it. 37. Totally called it. 36, okay. Um, <clears throat> and it, it suffers from all of the, hey, you know what worked? Everybody went to see this movie when we called it Fast and the Furious. Why don't we just repackage it and put it uh, put it out again two years later? And nobody bought it. Um, it it's, uh, it's not original. And you spend half of it, because because I saw this one, I started counting during the race sequences how many times we would jump in with the camera to see them shifting gears and uh, pounding the, uh, the clutch and the gas, mm -hmm. okay? And easily, you would top out at 20 different times you would jump in. So this ultimately became <laughs> automobile pornography, Pornography, okay? Because you're just watching dudes taking their pimped out models and pounding the gears through, okay? So you just, it's, it has nothing to do with any plot. It's just ridiculous. Uh, 36%. So then Tokyo Drift came out and it got 35%. This is again two, uh, three years later now. So we're at 53. We've gone down to 36 to 35. Fast and Furious came out in 2009. So they had three years to correct everything and they've gone down yet again to 27%. This is a franchise that is tanking faster than the Titanic. Okay, this is just a terrible, terrible franchise at this point. And yet, Fast and the Furious 5 comes out in 2011, and it gets a 78%. So they changed something. So they figured something out. Now, I haven't seen Fast 5, um, <clears throat> but Fast 6 came out this year, and the critical reception is garnering a 78%. So this is the highest that it's ever gotten for this franchise. The, um, the taglines are that it's the best action franchise uh, in Hollywood and it is the best uh, action movie so far this year. So it's getting a lot of really popular and positive hype. Uh, and so when I saw Too Fast, Too Furious... Um, I was actually really intrigued to see what exactly they had done because something has obviously changed. And it's either America has become that much dumber or they figured something out. And I'll, I will, uh, this is kind of where I have to eat my hat a little bit or eat my shoe <laughs> or eat my words. Uh, yeah, I want you to eat your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went and saw Fast 6, and it starts off with um, the two guys racing, the two main characters. Uh, one's the ex-cop at this point, and they both be become international criminals, and uh, they're living uh, <coughs> overseas in Spain because of their extradition um, uh, regulations there. They can't get deported to America and face criminal penalties and all kinds of stuff like that. But it starts off with them... Uh, going through the mountainsides in Spain and uh, just flying through these streets. And I started naturally because of the too fast, too furious trend. I started counting the number of times that we jumped in and we got to see them shifting gears. Cause I gotta be honest, there's nothing more boring than watching somebody shift gears. It doesn't add anything for me. <laughs> That's funny because uh, we made a short film together <laughs> when we specifically cut in to the clutch and the gear shift. Yeah, but we didn't do it 30 times. No, we did it once. Sequence. I think we did it maybe twice. But it adds something when it's like an <laughs> accentuation. But when you are doing it incessantly, then you, you got a problem. And they were doing it incessantly. And I am pleased to report that during the first race sequence, they didn't top 10. Hey, uh, so they that? right. So they've figured out that that was needless. Learned a lesson from it, and they they proceeded to tell uh, an entirely engaging story 
uh, along the lines of um, like a huge uh, balls-to-the-wall G.I. Joe kind of story uh, with, man, I, I want to say it's, it's G.I. Joe meets the Italian job uh, with Fast and the Furious Cars. How about that? So, <clears throat> yeah, you're, you, so you actually <laughs> liked it. Well, I, I did enjoy it a lot more than the second one, so it kind of puts it in that place where, yeah, it was enjoyable. They had a lot of action sequences that were like uh, far and away apart from just driving. There was some fight sequences. There was some chase elements inside this. They took one of the fights, and uh, you watch two of the ladies fight, and you're like, whoa, chick's fighting, and they're like hitting <laughs> hard. That's crazy. And then they they fight later on, and some of the dynamics have changed, and they get you rooting for the other character, and it's just total dynamic shift. And I was impressed. Huh. Um, <clears throat> now it is full of uh, terrible, terrible plot holes. I mean, in decisions, you're not going to watch this thinking, "Wow, like this is Jason Bourne." You're not going to be engaged on that level. But uh, it is a lot of fun, and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, spending the night watching Fast 6 because they they kind of learned what people liked and that they enjoyed seeing cars, but they didn't enjoy a story about cars. So other than right. Pixar would have us believe. <laughs> right. Well, good. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you had to eat your shirt. Uh, <laughs> and So along those lines, Tim, yeah. because of my um, very cathartic epiphany, I am proposing a homework assignment for you mm. because, um, well, mostly because I, I hope that you would garner the same kind of cathartic epiphany. But here's the deal. Uh, you very, uh, very loudly got on Facebook and said, everybody, I'm telling you right now, there is no reason to go out and see Epic. It looks terrible. It looks trite. And it looks superficial. Uh, well, yeah, bad, I'm not quoting yeah. you specifically, but those were the general uh, sentiments. Sure. Sure. And so I am going to say, I know that you hated the the Christmas movie that came out last year while everybody else liked it. That's true. But at least you went and saw it. And so I'm going to challenge you and say, Tim, take your kid, <laughs> go see Epic, and report back <laughs> as to whether or not you need to eat your shirt. My shirt. <laughs> Okay. All right, all right. I will. Uh, I'll write that down in my planner as a homework <laughs> assignment. Uh, of course, this is a, this is a tough week because um, there's no way I'm missing Man of Steel, and there's no yeah. way I'm missing uh, This Is the End, which opens up two days before Man of Steel. Yeah, if only um, there was some sort of magic movie pass that would so allow you. So I didn't have you. to pay. I could just see one yeah, a day. Yeah, you could mm. just go see movies without any kind of financial repercussion. <laughs> Well, it's it's a time thing, less than money thing. But okay, I hear I hear you, and uh, you went and saw two this week, so I will go see three this week, uh, and I'll report back on what is sure to be a wholly disappointing animated feature. Epic. Better watch it. God, just pick I, a shirt you don't mind eating. <laughs> All right, uh, on to the second part of our homework very quickly here. Uh, look, the internship uh, it it brings Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson back together. Um, after a successful stint in the uh, definitely R-rated comedy Wedding Crashers, a film that actually right. has a little bit of heart um, and some genuine laughs. Um, but in honor of uh, them reteaming and, and, and doing another picture, we decided to take a look at some other film duos, say our favorites or um, yeah, notable film duo, duos of uh, of the past. Um, <clears throat> Mike, you spent some time thinking about this. Did you? How did you organize yours? Did you uh, pick your favorite three duos? Did you put them in a category? Uh, how did you? How did you go about interpreting the assignment? Um, I just did my favorites, and then I actually did a uh, a couple that were classics. Uh, I think that deserve mentioned because without them uh, I'm sure comedic duos would have been started without them but these guys I mean are, they're just tops and, sure. and you don't hear comedians talking about um, or you don't hear comedians without them talking about how much these guys influence them 
Right. So, well, it's, how about this? I've I've got a couple of classics that I didn't really get into. It's just you know by way of mentioning, and by way of mentioning, sure. like I haven't seen really any of their films. So, um, uh, I don't know if that's the case for uh for you and uh and these guys. But let's let's hit the 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 foundational comic duos or film duos uh first. Uh, who do you got in your classic department? Uh, classics or or foundation like the ones that were talking about no like the classics, okay, classics. You know, yeah well obviously first i went with i shouldn't say obviously but first i went with uh, abbott and costello right right um because who's on first is just seminal you know, to <laughs> right that and comedic play and let me just throw out there that uh yeah i mean i i, I mentioned abbott and costello as somebody that I, I honestly haven't seen any of their features um the only thing i ever i have seen of them is uh, who's on first um, and did so because I performed who's on first well, no with way. a friend of mine yeah and it was it's still one of the most it's one of those great memories um, sure. it's a great little comic bit and they are amazing at it so um, yeah Abbott and Costello um, also Laurel and Hardy uh, another yep, yep. Uh, amazing uh, and influential uh, comic duo uh, and both of those, I've seen none of their you know features. Have you seen any of those uh, classic features? No. Mike? All no right. The only ones that I have seen come from Martin and Lewis. Um, okay. And I, I I don't remember which one I saw. I remember my parents got all uppity that I liked some of the people that I'm going to mention uh, next, and they were like, "Well, if you what haven't seen the classics, you yeah. need to come see some of this." So we took a year, and, and they got to pick out some classics for me, and I watched some of those. So, okay. Um, anybody else in the classic section? Well, it's a it's a classic, and it's not a classic. Mm -hmm. uh, but I put Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. I kind of took a page out of your book, okay? Because they one they were in Hamlet. And then they reunited for their own story, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Right. So, a couple of characters, not really actors, reuniting, but uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a worth enough. a mention. Fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, and then I would also throw in as kind of an older, um, definitely not as old as uh, Abbott Costello, Laurel and Hardy, but uh, Jack Lemmon and Walter Matthau. Um, yeah. Like odd couple, and sure. Then coming back as. Uh, Grumpy Old Men, and I'm sure maybe some other films um, in the interim. Uh, again, not really, gonna... not really my bag, but uh, I did see Grumpy Old Men, and it was reasonably funny. Yeah. Uh, so I thought you were going to say uh, uh, Richard Pryor and, and Gene Wilder. You know what? I, uh, I think that they deserve mention because they actually did several films together. I mean, right. I think yeah. at least three. Uh, I could be wrong there, but I think at least three. And like Brewster's Millions. I don't know. Actually, I don't know if... Were uh, they both in that? I know they were in Stir Crazy, and they were in See No Evil, Hear No Evil. Um, but those were all 80s movies like I remember seeing the ads for, but I wasn't able to go see movies right. in the theater right. at the time. And, uh, and there's just there's something about 80s movies that they just have a funk to them that I don't want to go back and watch. There's only a handful of like 80s <laughs> movies that I'm really interested in. In terms of comedies, like I'll like. see tra Trading Places, uh, Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd training places. Okay. And, you know, for a lot of Eddie Murphy movies, honestly, to me, hold up from the '80s. So Beverly Hills well, Cop, I'm... 48 Hours, uh, Trading Places, Coming to America, like all of those are are still really strong comedies for me. Yeah, and then the pinnacle of '80s movies for you is mm. Back to the Future. It is. Uh, that's yeah. That's definitely, and you know, which brings up the point, like when talking about film duos, do you talk about people that have appeared in the same uh, or in multiple films together if they're part of the same series? And so I don't put Christopher Lloyd and uh, Michael J. Fox in this list because they're part of the same series, which I think you have to view as one film um, and uh, or, you know, one set of characters. So they don't count. Okay. Uh, but uh, Mike, go ahead, and we should probably hustle through this bit. Uh, yeah, we'll go quick. What are your What are your favorite uh, recurring film uh, duos? Right. So, first one that came to mind when you mentioned the homework was uh, Akuras Kira Kurosawa and Toshiro Mifune because they did most of the films that he put together together. Um, so you're talking about but, just a little director actor. Yeah, that was just the first thing that came to mind. Um, and then when you refine it to comedic duos that reunite on screen together. Uh, I went with Adam Sandler and Rob Schneider. And then obviously my pinnacle, 
would be Chris Farley and David Spade. Um, and how many films did Farley and Spade do together? Shoot, I want to say three. Okay, so that, I mean, there was, there was two, Black Sheep, two for Tommy sure. Boy, Black Sheep. Yeah. And you know what? I think I ridiculed you for um, for praising uh, Beverly Hills Ninja uh, <laughs> in an earlier podcast. I know David's. I don't think David Spade's in that one. I don't think he was. Either. Um, but uh, I I saw a clip from from that film, and you know what? It really was funny. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I need to see the whole the whole film. That um, I I might need to apologize for ridiculing you for that one. Well, so yeah, wait, I mean, wait a couple of weeks because your your plate's kind of full right now. It's true. I've got a lot of homework. Um, all right, I you know I didn't go in terms of my favorites. I went with some um, some themed ones. So okay. uh, first in the prolific theme uh, and also modern, um, Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson. Uh, yeah. Of course, Owen Wilson is part of tonight's uh, film, but. Uh, he, he and Ben Stiller have done a bunch together. Cable Guy, Permanent Midnight, Meet the Parents, uh, Zoolander, uh, Starsky and Hutch, yes. both Fockers movies, both Night at the Museums, although I think uh, Wilson's cameo in the first one is rather small. And then, of course, easily the best film out of all of their uh, uh, pairings is uh, Royal Tenenbaums. They're Zoolander. both in that film. Oh. No. Oh, did I skip Zoolander? No, you said Zoolander. Oh, okay. You said the best one. No, Royal Tenenbaums is, come on. So, I, I, I granted, it's different from a lot of their other films, but it's, it's definitely <laughs> the best film. So, Didn't that make you watch Zoolander? Uh, I got through about 15 or 20 minutes before I turned it off, but that was before <laughs> my comedic uh, taste really developed. So, I, I need to see it. I think I would find it much funnier now. Okay. Um, so that's in the prolific category. In the in the classic category, um, you know, aside from the people that we've talked about before, um, I, I think you have to bring up Paul Newman and Robert Redford. Uh, okay. Of course, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid and The Sting. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. another film in there somewhere. Right. But uh, two really great uh, 70s movies, I want to say, with uh, two amazing, amazing uh, leading men. Uh, in them. So Newman and Redford. Wow. In the disappointing category, stick with <laughs> stick with me here. Uh, De Niro and Pacino. And I only say, I mean, uh. so of course they've recurred. They were actually in Godfather Two together, but not together together. So they're right, not right. really a duo there. But one of my favorite crime films of all time is Heat from Michael Mann. Um, they share one of my favorite screen moments uh, at the end. Uh, and I, it's it's a fantastic, fantastic film. But then they came out is and did... The, is that the scene where they get the shawarma? <laughs> what? <laughs> Sorry, that's that's from the Avengers. I'm oh, sorry, Iron Man. Uh, oh, yeah, your Avengers, you're right. Um, so, uh, so Heat is fantastic, but then they came out with Righteous Kill a couple of years ago, which just fell flat. I mean, they're still great actors, mm-hmm. but they... They've reteamed uh, to do something that just it was probably a payday for the both of them and uh, wasn't worth. It. So it's a little bit, a little bit disappointing there. In the category of my favorite, favorite right now anyway, um, Simon Pegg and Nick Frost. Oh yes, uh, they have done a ton of just wonderfully fun movies. That's all they do is just fun stuff together. So they got started, the first IMDb credit with both of them, and it is a show called Big Train. I don't know anything about it. I think it's sketch comedy. But the the one that was kind of a breakout and which teamed them with Edgar Wright, who directed, uh, who's directed two of their films now, the third one coming out called The World's End, um, was a show called Spaced. is a BBC show. It ran two seasons, seven episodes per season. So it's a total of 14 episodes. It's on Netflix. And it's the first season anyway is super low budget and totally silly and a bunch of fun and features two best friends named Mike and Tim. Ah. Ah. So check out Spaced if you haven't before. It's, it's honestly, it's wonderful. Um, and then, of course, they have gone on to do Shaun of the Dead, yeah. uh, which is great. Hot Fuzz, which is one of the 
funniest movies it's, I've ever yeah, seen. It's one of my favorites of theirs. Uh, Peg and Frost uh, did Paul. Uh, it's a little bit of a uh, tribute to Close Encounters and other uh, alien invasion movies, but a huge Close Encounters tribute um, and is a lot of fun, but both Simon Pegg and Nick Frost in there. And, and maybe not everybody realizes they're both in Adventures of Tintin as uh, the Thompsons. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, fantastic duos. And honestly, with the internship and Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson, it's a great, it's a great duo. It's a, I'm glad uh, that they've come back and done another uh, film together. But uh, they, I don't even know if they they fit on this list between Peg and Frost and Stiller and Wilson. Right, right. Um, you know, they they served as the impetus for us to think about it. But uh, but uh, Peg and Frost, Stiller and Wilson, heck, even De Niro and Pacino. Um, it's in a whole and a and. Uh, those are, those are Wilder and uh, and Richard Pryor. I mean, like, yeah. So we we need to see two or three more from Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson for them to be in the same category. But they are uh, they are fun in their own right. And speaking of which, sure. why don't we move right on into uh, our film parlay on the internship? Well, hey, before you do that, I just want to yeah. let you know. You asked me how I was doing earlier, and and, and I, I was busy, and I was I was being honest. But the exciting news is, you know, earlier I was in a blender and now I'm saving lives. <laughs> what? 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 You blender earlier, lives. Earlier I was in a blender. Okay. Now I'm saving lives. No what? one has any idea what we're talking about. <laughs> Let's see the internship. Oh, that's a great story. And uh, you'll understand. Uh, so, Sean Levy's The Internship. <clears throat> All right. Um, what are we going to say about the internship? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's do a quick synopsis. All right. no? Okay. Uh, okay. Do you want me? You want me to do it? You want to do it? Uh, yeah. Why don't you jump in? Okay. All right. Uh, so the internship, written in part <laughs> by Vince Vaughn, based on a story uh, from Vince Vaughn. Uh, this is kind of it's it's your basic underdog movie. You've got a couple of guys down on their luck who basically swing for the fences at one last opportunity to reinvent their lives. Um, in this case, it's a couple of salesmen uh, who are very personal, um, as a good salesmen tend to be, and they find themselves without a sales job and um, in a new digital tech-filled world that isn't very personal. And uh, they get an internship, as you gather from the trailer, at Google, and, of course, they're fish out of water. They're fish out of... that. That's the plural, fish out of water. Um, <clears throat> they meet all kinds of obstacles and, in the process, uh, either do or do not uh, end up with full-time jobs at Google. Uh, we'll save that for the spoiler section. Um, that's about it. That's the premise, right? Did I leave anything that's out it. in well, terms of what it is? Right. It's it's simple. Is. This is a simple movie. Um, the question is: Is it is it enjoyable? Is it funny? You watch the trailers, you get the idea that it is not groundbreaking in terms of story. So the question is: um, Are the characters worth watching? Is it is it enjoyable on a comedic level? Um, Who's going to go first in here, Mike? You or me? I'll go for it. Go. Oh, you want me oh, to go? Oh, no, you're telling oh, me to go yeah, for it. I'm okay. Go for it. I will go for it then. Um, strikes against the movie. It's incredibly formulaic. Um, okay. You basically have, uh, I mean, it, so you've got heroes down on their luck, insurmountable odds. They have an opposition. Uh, that's in pursuit of the same goal that they are, uh, that has tons of resources and is really arrogant. Um, you throw in a love interest, you throw in some side characters uh, with lessons to learn about themselves, and um, and then it's a race to the finish to see, you know, who does what. Um, 
honestly, Twister follows pretty much the same formula. Dodgeball, also starring Vaughn, does the same yeah. thing. Titanic, even, uh, particularly yeah, with the rich, you know, the rich, uh, arrogant villain. Um, mean Girls, Happy Gilmore, Cool Runnings, uh, The Wizard with Fred cool Savage. Runnings. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> these are. It's, a, it's kind boy. of this, the same story. The question is, like, are the you know are there some moments um, of of value here? Um, it, the internship follows a similar formula that we have seen a uh, hundred times. Uh, I'm gonna cut that out. So there is a lot to hate if you are uh, cynical and looking for something new about the film, um, and yet I. I enjoyed it. Uh, here's why: Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson. <laughs> they are. In a nutshell. Yeah, I. I mean, be honest about what the film is. Everybody in the movie is an excuse to get Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson together to do their shtick. But the the difference is in terms. Of, okay, yes, it's Vince Vaughn um, doing rapid fire uh, delivery of his lines and Owen Wilson being a kind of a bumpkin and, and, uh, just earnest and sweet. And, <clears throat> um, then they, they're doing their thing. Um, and everybody else is just basically setting them up to do their thing. And if you make peace with that, then you can enjoy Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson doing their thing, but they're doing their thing kind of, um, as as earnest as Owen Wilson maybe is in a lot of his films, both Vaughn and Wilson play characters who are just really, really nice guys that actually like people, um, enjoy helping people, and honestly, they're f they're fun guys to just spend some time with. And uh, you know the, the the setups for the personal journeys they're all tossaways, but but it's they're such strong performances that I enjoyed myself. Um, as that formulaic supporting cast, um, honestly, I was a little confused. And this actually helped me enjoy the movie, I think. The movie mm. was so earnest that it surprised me that they were sticking with such well-trod tropes for this kind of movie. But since they were, I ended up sort of consuming those elements as if they were a parody of the formula that they were uh, acting within. Um, so with the, the, the rich villain, um, he, yeah, he's, he is their opposition, but he's so over the top and so exactly what we've seen a thousand times. Right, right. I kind of laughed at him as a critique of other thinly sketched villains that, 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 that don't have any true humanity. You know what I mean? Um, the, the, the people that, you know, there's a, there's another character on, on, Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson's team, who's cynical and and has his nose stuck in technology and isn't interacting with people on a human level, and again, that was just so obvious that it felt like a sort of a parody of that kind of character, and so I interacted with them on that level as if they were sort of ironic critiques of those things in other movies. Okay. Okay. However, um. That perspective sort of breaks down ultimately when they don't they don't subvert of expectations. Like in the end, those characters play out exactly how they would have in other movies. Um, so unless you count the fact that I expected subversion and they subverted that expectation, um, <laughs> the, you know, it's like the height of irony. I, I don't think you can stick with my my initial view that maybe this movie was a parody of bad movies. Um, the character cliches are super thick, but they're so thick that they're funny. Um, and even if the filmmakers are expecting us to be invested in their personal journey, which in the end I simply couldn't do, I still sort of enjoyed them as just as just being stupid and obvious. Um, there was a self-aware feel for most of the movie about those cliches, and so I accepted them um, kind of as a framework for Vaughn and Wilson to be charming within. Um, and in the end, I don't think it's a very good movie, um, but I did enjoy it. I don't think it's a waste of money. And that is what I thought of the internship. Wow. Well, next time uh, I'm going to go first because you have pretty much said it all. Uh, let me <laughs> oh, see yeah. here what I got. Uh, underdog story, you said that. Um, 
likable kid. You know, you got that. There's uh, Owen Wilson. He definitely said that they were in it. Uh, the stories. <laughs> <clears throat> no, so yeah. Um, I mean, you did. You touched on a lot of the uh, uh, the main points about about what's going on here. <clears throat> For me, it was. Uh, I mean, you talked about them having just these really, really galvanized uh, stereotypes. And uh, it's definitely true. Um, however, to me, they weren't necessarily wrong. Um, for me, stereotypes don't work when uh, the stereotype is just there to facilitate something else. But um, a lot of kids these days, even myself included, walk around with our heads uh, glued to our phones. Uh, we're just constantly looking down. And um, I think a lot of these stereotypes are actually, I think that this movie facilitated the ability to talk about the stereotypes that we actually embody. Um, and <clears throat> uh, you have characters like Owen Wilson and uh, uh, why can't I think of his name? Vince Vaughn. Totally brain farted. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn who, who are people people you know they're they're all about connecting with people and so this whole idea of technology totally eludes them um, and you have that fish out of water story and then the underdog story that underpins it um, but for me the the meshing of the digital and tech the uh, the eye generation and with you know somebody from a generation that has hasn't become totally reliant on technology um, I, I think that there's a, a lot to laugh at with that and this facilitated the ability to do that um, and then you have the characters kind of burgeoning out of themselves and out of their stereotypes and not necessarily into anything profound um, but the fact that they were able to get out of the stereotypes I think that that's one of the positive notes of the whole movie is that you have I mean, even even Vince Vaughn and, and Owen Wilson's characters are stereotypes of salesmen, right? And they were able to kind of step outside of of uh, of these stereotypes that they were pinned in. And, and um, I think you said something along the lines of the the personal growth moments mm -hmm. uh, were shallow, and they were they weren't. This whole movie is not about the the depth plumbing the depths of humanity. But the fact that you have stereotypes that can kind of break out of their stereotypes is still a positive and encouraging note. And because the whole movie is so positive and encouraging along those lines, it was just fun to to watch, to watch yeah. these people come out of themselves and, and figure out what they're willing to do to, uh, you know, uh, take on another level and expand their horizons. And those character yeah. journeys were... Uh, weren't a total wash in that sense. So, yeah, I totally, right. I totally I feel the underdog thing. I enjoyed it. I think that the story has a little bit more fresh packaging for today's uh, society and culture. Huh. Um, and it's not... I mean, so many of these stories are like specifically geared toward or, pl toward or play out better in sports uh, arenas. <laughs> and the fact that this is um, an underdog story that plays out so well in um, in a totally different arena. I found that refreshing. So, okay. yeah, my my two cents are it's worth it's worth you know it's worth your time. You'll have a couple laughs. You'll have a really entertaining light story, and and it'll end on a positive note. And you'll be you'll be all the better for it. Yeah, I I think you give um, them a little bit more credit uh, in terms of uh, the the. The supporting cast and and their sort yeah. of uh, journeys that they go through, uh, and that's fine. I think, yeah. Unless, I mean, just to to reiterate, I I honestly I just spent the whole movie with a with a with a smile on my face, um, and then occasionally laughed pretty stinking hard. And I think being a it, you know it's it's great as a child of the eighties. Um, I think you know that that aged set is going to enjoy a lot of the. And the humor that sure. they throw down. Um, maybe the younger set uh, m might not as much um, because honestly, um, 
it's a little bit of a criticism of maybe the younger right, in you so far as the stereotypes yeah, yeah in so far as the stereotypes are uh, of younger generation you know you might feel yourself kind of pigeonholed into some of those stereotypes or whatever and and I definitely as an older person I'm identifying with the people um, of you know the quote unquote heroes of the film and uh, so I you know I enjoyed it I just Owen Wilson um, talking about <laughs> him uh, Vince Vaughn stealing his car and going out and um, taking you know the girl in, in the car out to the lake or whatever and you guys were working on your night moves and you didn't, yeah, you had no idea know, what you were doing yeah, but you yeah, did like, it anyway it was like straight from the Bob Seger song and it was just it was amazing and I, I just love those little moments and um, again it's just so earnest and so really anti-cynical all the way to the end so let's let's move into spoilers um, just so we can talk about that overall positive tone that they set um, sure yeah uh, without giving away any of the uh, uh, plot uh, details so internship spoilers all right, so one of the interesting elements for us is, is just how positive the movie is and how it, it never like falls into that ironic um, gotcha. Uh, these guys are super positive. They like people, and, um, and the people that are cynical and ironic, uh, they end up either losing or needing to change. And it goes all the way through the end, right through even having Vince Vaughn and Owen Wilson uh, win the Google internship competition and end up with a job, um, which I felt like there might be some room for, you know, greater, greater enjoyment if they did not win the whole uh, competition. Um, right and, now, I'm going to jump and, in real quick. And, yeah, go ahead. Because <clears throat> uh, did you ever see the the movie uh, Step Brothers? Will Ferrell. Uh, no, I didn't. Okay, that movie kind of has what you you're talking about, and t to be honest, um, I anticipated that Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn would not win. Like I figured they wouldn't. I figured they'd go through some journey where they learned something about themselves and they would be successful elsewhere. Um, uh, Step Brothers does that, um, and not to get too much into that, but what they what they set up is this idea of where these two characters are going to go. Uh, they end up having to learn some lessons through some pretty hard situations that they create, uh, very comedically, I might add. Um, but in the end, they go and find their own success, and it's uh, it's very satisfying. Um, I kind of pegged this movie as as following in line with that. Um, I was, I, I really was surprised, to be honest, that they ended <laughs> it with uh, the fact that th their team wins, that Owen Wilson and Vince Vaughn get the jobs there. It, it, I was kind of taken back. It didn't, it didn't add up. And I think that yeah. you and I kind of sit with that. But I wanted to just say... Um, it for the formula and to make sure that the movie didn't just run on and go on past when it should have ended. Um, I think that it serves its purpose. So, okay. You know, yeah, I think that's, there's something to be said for that. Yeah. I mean the, the reveal, you know, of them winning with, um, I, I forget, uh, the internship heads name, but he's on the, uh, he's on the daily show. And, um, you know, he, he also plays a character that's kind of, similar to uh, other f sports underdog movies, which is sort of a mentor who's really hard on uh, the, the protagonist and ends up being an integral part of what helps them achieve. Um, you know, and you might even think he's so hard he's maybe against them, but he turns out to be for them. Yeah, um, and I appreciated and they that review. tried to do that with him. I thought they did it really ineffectively because mainly he was a jerk, um, but it turns out he at one point wanted them to succeed and they ended up succeeding and he was mildly pleased with that. Um, but the end, like, I, I don't know, he didn't actually help them in any way. You know what I mean? I wanted to see some right. sort of, it was because he was hard on them. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm asking you more from like the, the head of search helped out Vince Vaughn that one right, night, like, right. kind of had that moment where you appreciated the fact that this guy was going out of his way to help 
Right. You want to see um, the head uh, of the inter internship department. Just, you know, for a little bit of... I just felt like he was he was bitter for no reason. They didn't give him... But again, it's a minor detail uh, in a movie that's really just meant for the, for the two leads. I just think with a couple of tweaks, maybe getting rid of one of the other members of their team because, you know, okay, so the Asian kid was kind of funny and yeah, we get it. His right. mom is, and the, the, the girl, uh, you know, then they have kind of creepy, like mid forties, Vince Vaughn hitting on essentially, I mean like playing father figure to the 19 year old, but you don't, you know, you also know right. he's single. And so is this going to turn romantic? But then I, you know, so that, that was a little weird. And, and then of course the cynical guy, he's the one who makes the big, big shift, you know? And, um, Oh man, at the just the scene at the the Golden Gate Bridge where he's like, "Oh, we can stay for a little while and enjoy the view." Like that was just so painful. That was cheesy. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, and and a lot of the tr you know the turns and transitions um, f felt a little bit like that. But they're outweighed by Owen Wilson's speech getting Vince Vaughn you know to come back and right. and and uh, Vince Vaughn you know <laughs> talking about flash dance multiple times and. And I, yeah, like it, it was just, it was a lot of fun. But um, Mike, what do you think about, about something that is just unabashedly positive? Like this is about two guys with a dream and who are just nice to people right. and, and, and doing their best and they end up succeeding. Like even when they probably shouldn't succeed, they did um, maybe because they're just such nice guys and deserve it. Do you like a movie like that? Um, I do. Um, and, and to my surprise, to my great surprise after having such a long time of watching movies and what and whatnot, uh, you know, you, after a while growing up watching movies, you kind of get to the point where you're like, well, the good guy always wins. I want to see a movie where the bad guy wins. Um, and <clears throat> you get to a point after that happens so many times where you just go, hang on, uh, you know, in real life, oftentimes the bad guy wins, and that sucks. Uh, what if everybody was kind of a lot nicer to each other? Uh, and so you have movies like this where it's it's not grounded in reality, but you have this um, like effervescent presence of people just caring about people, um, and it creates this really really positive atmosphere that. It's uh, not not that it creates this fairy tale sense for the rest of life, but it just creates almost this uh, pot. Like, let me let me just give it a contrast. When you went and saw Pain and Gain, um, you left there feeling like things were just going to go bad. Like yeah. you just had this foreboding sense. Right. It was um, gross. And, and it's like, yeah, you just felt dirty and, and whatnot. Um, and that that comment stuck with me after seeing this and, and talking with you a little bit. Um, simply because when you see something like this, where where people genuinely care about each other, uh, or at least present the idea of it, uh, it, it it just becomes such a striking uh, contrast to the cynicism that that can easily happen to us in everyday life. That it's it's just this really pleasant um, takeaway. Is, so, I mean, is this and, the and first it, of its kind? Is this the big? No, it, and it seems to be a very, uh, at least, a burgeoning trend in Hollywood. Um, I can. There's a there's a couple other films where where there's this theme present where we have um, kind of these existential questions asked or characters who should be or could be or even have been presented as being uh, hardened and cynical, but we have them um, portraying this really positive, uh, personable uh, character, and it ends up benefiting, uh, at, least, at least for the viewing. Um, man, so the next question would be, so what, what are some of those films? Uh, the first one that came to mind would be uh, Tree of Life. Hmm which is uh, probably my, the, of the many reasons to love that movie. Um, it is an ex existential film that plums the depths of why do we exist? Um, and it comes away with two uh, 
clashing ideas of, of, of nature, of, of dominance, of power, and, and the, the right to just take what you can get, uh, even if there's uh, hurtful consequences. And they call that nature. And then you have uh, of essentially love. Um, and the whole story kind of climaxes with the, the reveal that, uh, at least for Terrence Malick, love is the greatest uh, reason for existence. And there's a catharsis for uh, the character who believes that, that power and nature was, the, was this. And you have this really dynamic shift in atmosphere. Oh. Uh, when you watch it and it's 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 palpable and it was totally moving and you, you i i have seen several um you know like like a rebel without a cause and and some existential films like that where i mean in the title itself they're talking about you know this there is no purpose to life and so all that's left is whatever you want to do with it go do that um and it can cre- create this really cynical idea of, of uh, you know, the will to dominate and, and stuff like that that ends up hurting people more than it does helping people. Um, there's a couple other films that, that really jump out. Um, shoot. I'm going to save this one for last because you're going you're gonna to bust my chops for it. But, uh, like, let's say we bought the a... The Feminist. No. <laughs> no, there's nothing redeemable about that series. Um, <clears throat> we bought a uh, yeah, zoo. Yeah, we bought out. a zoo. Sure, sure. Um, Gran Torino. Um, and I was going to oh. ask you about this. Well, I'll ask you in a minute. But uh, Beasts of the Southern Wild just came out. That one mm. was about this really incredibly hard life that a child has to endure. And it mm. ends on this incredibly positive note that I didn't see mm. coming and, and mm. uh, I absolutely adored the whole movie. I mean, it was, just felt like. It felt like that throughout, and so I thought they were going to throw me a curveball and just sweep, sweep the rug out from under me, and just mm. uh, like rip my heart out at the end. And instead, they they went with a positive play, and, and it made for a, I mean, just really positive, and my heart swelled. I mean, it was just it was just totally moving. Um, right. Even Cloud Atlas, hmm. the impossible, um, and um, if you think back to night and day with tom cruise oh please no 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 here you have (coughs) Fi, who should be in every rights he should be john mcclain or uh, arnold schwarzenegger and be hardened but the whole time through he is being absolutely positive and a total gentleman to the girl he's just absolutely just like vince vaughn and this and uh and owen wilson in this just absolutely heartwarming the whole way through and it was the first time, not, not that Night and Day is a good movie, uh-huh. um, but it carries that positive tone. Huh. Um, so the, and then I'm just going to end with, uh, <clears throat> man, I can't even say it. I can't say it, Tim. Jeez. Say it, Mike. Warm bodies. <laughs> <laughs> because well, good, good the, the whole zombie apocalypse is supposed to be this <laughs> negative... Uh, you know, life on the brink, survivalist nature versus humanity thing, and you come away with like love conquers. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that that is interesting. I mean, it, it's definitely a, it's definitely a positive uh, right. film with a you know a, it's a feel good film. Um, I feel like it's a it's it's a to, weaker entry into the into the. <laughs> For well, sure. because because totally. I feel like Warm Bodies is positive, <laughs> but it's positive as a result of it being ironic. So I'm still going to approach okay. something, and I'm going to give it the I'm a smart ass twist, and I'm, that means I'm going to take something that's really dark and negative and make it into something that's positive. Um, okay. And and I th- and I think that that's cool. I mean, I'm I'm glad that they did it. Um, I I. You know, I think there's a little bit of difference between that and something like the internship, which is just like um, we're we're not twisting anything. We're just we're gonna have like a wild or wide-eyed, childlike approach. To right, right. Our you know, our story. The films that I mentioned are kind of various <laughs> stages of uh, it. If that, at least yeah, there's yeah, yeah. a presence. Um, and the one that I wanted to ask you about was uh, you had mentioned that you'd seen a serious man. 
And I wanted to ask you if that kind of had that ending on a positive. Oh, have you seen it? I have not. But I know that it's it's definitely an existential. Yeah. Um. Man, it's it it's it's and it's so hard to classify your favorite Cohen Cohen Brothers film. But it is um it's very different from a lot of the films. It's still very very Cohen. Um, it's brilliant. It's one of it's it's a, among the top for me. Um, and but I would not say. Uh, I mean, it it literally ends with a dark storm approaching from the horizon. So, <laughs> to answer your question, huh. okay. does it end positively? N- no, <laughs> um, like in in a in a literal sense, there's some, but but there's just there's a lot of interpretation to be happening there and it's just you know the it's it's about a tumultuous life and um uh it's wonderful but it's n- i wouldn't put it in this category of just like wide-eyed positivity no okay um <clears throat> the other one i was going to mention um mm-hmm. but it, it deserves a lot more discussion would be the master mm. uh, because that that one had I mean, there were there were a few, but very few dark, uh, existentially pointless or cynical tones throughout. Uh-huh. I mean, everything was kind of uh, bright and light, and and uh, kind of I don't know. I don't know that I would say uh, wide eyed and innocent, but um, I mean, it yeah, definitely that's, that's begs further. That, anyway, wait, there's there's a yeah. lot less of that kind of uh, rebel without a cause, mm-hmm. pointlessness going on. Well, know? I think I think that that's uh, I think it's a good point, and I'm I'm I think that that you know that's just the way of the the world. I mean, we're big pendulum swingers, and and uh, you know the '90s and early 2000s. No, we're not. <laughs> I mean, uh, I guess we are. We're a big <laughs> we're a big uh, pendulum swing in the. Um, you know, and even you know before the '90s. I mean, it's sort of the uh, you know the postmodern world was a world that rejected um, overarching narrative, and, and because they reject, you know, there there is no trust of the authorities that provide that overarching narrative uh, for our history. And and right, which, um, great tie-in for a movie about Google right. and everything that Google right. represents, like right. the big main everything. Yeah. Um, but they, you, what we see, I mean, I, I don't know if you noticed, but Lost was, you know, one of the first shows to, um, to have a really grand scope, but all under a unified narrative, right? Um, right, right. There, there were other shows that were, were big before, but they kind of, they, they weren't about one thing essentially, and they they didn't have a very defined mythology. And and now that that's the new thing is that you have these huge stories, but it's really one gigantic story. And that's not postmodern. That's anti postmodern. So I don't know if that's post postmodern or post post postmodern, but we're swinging back in another direction that is sort of rejecting some of that stuff from the fifties and the sixties and the seventies. And I think um, we're we're starting to see uh, you know some some positivity coming back from the you know particularly you know from the comedians who they're the cutting edge of this you know cynical worldview and they 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 slash um, you know the world with their with their criticism and their critique and their uh, you know their witty observations and and now you see comedians returning to um, sort of touching heartrending stories like good guy stuff and right. uh and i i think that that's it's interesting to note and for my taste um i kind of like it i like to uh you know it i don't know it's the kind of thing it's it's the world that the muppets can come back and make a movie in you know what i mean and they did right um it's something very very positive it's an underdog story I, hey you know what they follow the same formula you got chris cooper who's just a, you know, a, a jerk and these under-resourced good guys and they end up achieving in the end. And um, I, and I like that we can do that. I, I want to see it f- 
you know, internship, the other characters don't feel true. They don't feel um, real and identifiable. And I think that you can still have a sweet, um, childlike, innocent sort of tone to a film and, and, and still have it grounded in reality. And, and internship didn't necessarily feel that way for me, but um, I think it is possible, and I'm glad that they're at least kind of moving in that direction. Yeah, that's great. Thanks for letting me go on a little rant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's uh, I th- you know, let's wrap it up. There's other stuff to talk about in the film. There are some really good jokes. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I mean, unexpected moments, fresh comedy uh, that I that I didn't expect. You know, just a couple of moments, but but really fun in there. And honestly, it's you could do worse. You know, you got Man of Steel coming out. Um, and we still have Star Trek out there. You might even still be able to t- see Jurassic Park 3D if you find it in a cheap theater somewhere. Um, but uh, if you're looking for a comedy, um, you know, honestly, I enjoyed this more than Admission um, and definitely more yeah. than Burt Wonderstone. Uh, yeah. So, so it's, this, is, this is one of the better comedies that's come out so far this, uh, this year. And um, it's not a, not a bad date night movie uh, at all. Uh, but I think that wraps it up for uh, the internship. And as we mentioned before, opening uh, this coming week is Man of Steel, which we will be doing next week's yes. early on. As well as, and here's what's awesome, Man of Steel opens up on Friday the 14th. You can probably catch the 10 o'clock showing on Thursday the uh, 13th at 10 o'clock. Um, but interestingly, This is the End opens up on Wednesday the 12th, which means maybe a Tuesday night, 10 o'clock, showing for This is the End. This is the... Uh, Apocalyptic uh, comedy starring uh, James Franco, Seth Rogen, yeah, uh, Jay Burrell. Yeah, and uh, it's getting a lot of good buzz. And um, so, so two really strong movies to check out. Also, Sofia Coppola's next film, The Bling Ring, based on a true story, uh, is uh, opening up this week as well. So lots of good stuff to get out there and see uh, this coming week. And uh, epic. Yeah, Mike, I thought we would do... Oh, and epic for me, yes. <clears throat> uh, Man of Steel, homework. Uh, I want you to come up with, now sometimes we just come up with a theme and we're free to uh, discuss or you know, come up with a list where we're either saying, oh, these are my favorite or these are what I think are the best or these are themed picks within that larger theme. Um, I want to do the top 10 comic book or graphic novel inspired films. And what I mean to say is not your favorite, but what you consider to be the best films. So there is a difference, of course, between um, something that is your favorite and something okay. you consider to be the best, right? And a lot of times mm, those things will will coincide. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes something that's your favorite, you know it's not very good, but for whatever reason, it's your favorite. I'm saying strip that away and look at what you think are objectively the best films. And then we're going to play a little bit of a game with that uh, next week. So come up with your list of 10. And then um, uh, the only the only thing I need to mention uh, on your honor is that uh, as you're doing that, do not go to Rotten Tomatoes and check out the Rotten Tomato scores for those things, okay? Oh, okay, sure. Okay, just Got make it. the list kind of on your own and uh, irrespective of what critical opinion is of those films, okay? Okay. All right. Um, we're talking like solely based on the film's merits, right? Because there's a lot of the graphic novels that I haven't seen or touched. Right. I'm not saying uh, you are like evaluating uh, the Watchmen based right, like on well both the novel and the film. No, 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 no. I mean, like okay. just taking the film on its own. Uh, how do you how do you evaluate it? Okay. Right? All right. And. Um, I think that about does it. If you uh, have any feedback, uh, hit uh, me up or uh, Mike. You can hit us both up at Tim at filmparlay.com or you can tweet us at filmparlay on Twitter. Um, and besides that, I think we will just check everybody else. Uh, let's, let's do a better sign-off than this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so that about does it. Uh, feel free to leave us some feedback at Film Parlay on Twitter or Tim at FilmParlay.com uh, if you want to leave a longer response. We thank you for joining us. Um, love to hear your thoughts on films that we have talked about or films that we haven't talked about. Um, we can incorporate that into the next show. 
jump on iTunes and give us a rating that does help other people find us, which uh, we're eager to do. Tell your friends. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, we will see everybody later, I suppose. Mike? <laughs> Boat drinks. Boat drinks. All right. We'll do something with that. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop and save. Man, that was long enough. I don't know if I want to do a Game of Thrones. Yeah, I kind of went along. Well, no, 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 no. Well, <laughs> we, we, didn't even, we didn't even get to your point until like an hour and 20. So we, right, we, but I went long with, with uh, Fast and the Furious. I went a little bit long I, with that. Well, I think maybe I'll try and cut some other stuff. You know, uh, maybe our Game of Thrones discussion, since we didn't, you know what I mean, we'll release that as an uh, B-side some other time or something like that. But it's just, yeah, I'll, I'll have to try and cut this down to under an hour 30. I'm at an hour 42. Yeah, I think I'm at an hour. I'm at an hour 44. I gotta write. I gotta write in like an outro because I stumbled over that one. <clears throat> All right, dude. Well, that was good. Uh, save it up and um, shoot me your file. Oh, I'll shoot you. Mm-hmm. All right, man. Yeah, it felt like a good conversation. Yeah, and I was just going to say, because maybe we won't do the B-side thing, but uh, what I was going to say was, you made the comment that there's a grand scope. Uh, first of all, well... Oh, we're um, talking about Game of Thrones. Yeah, Game of Thrones. I just The comment that you made was, um, the scope of the story is so much larger that you... That it's as if he's asking us not to look at individuals as characters in the in the in the story, but families as characters in the story. And so, right, if right. if you make that, if you take that and shrink it down, um, what does a character normally go through in a well-told story? Obstacle over obstacle over obstacle over obstacle that gets worse and worse and worse until the last moment they're strong and they achieve whatever goal they're after. How does that <coughs> look when the characters, in this case, are the Starks, the Lannisters, the Faze, the et cetera, et cetera? Et cetera. Right. Um, well, might it be that the Starks will have all but one family member killed, and then it will be that one family member that finally, say, kills Joffrey or you know, kills Joffrey so that Khaleesi can take the throne. You know what I mean? Like, I don't see the Starks right, like as... unifies the kingdoms and, and whatnot. Yeah. Play, and yeah. And some justice. <laughs> Plays an integral role in putting what we will eventually feel like is the right person on the throne. I'll tell you what. Let me... Oh shit, I don't know if I, I should tell you this. I mean, did Lisa give you some pretty good detail from that third book? Yeah. yeah. I'll tell you <clears throat> what they're laying the groundwork for is that the ultimate scheming and most devious and horrible bad guy in the whole show is Littlefinger. Yeah. <clears throat> so you have, I mean, Joffrey is the, <coughs> is the jump to, right? He's, he's the obvious. He's, he's obviously sick, right? Sick of the head. Right. Um, but Littlefinger is, is conniving in, in such a profound way mm -hmm. that his evil is... Uh, I mean, it is so much more far-reaching and grotesque. Um, yeah. And the way that he is maneuvering himself... That's what's so amazing. Starks. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and that, yeah. So um, I remember, I think I remember that conversation. That was the conversation we had when uh, when Ned, Ned died. Yeah, and I was and, pissed. Uh, and you were outraged. Yeah. Um, and so for me, that's also why I'm sticking with it. But again... right. Um, you know, there's seven archetypes for any story, right? And we all know every story that's ever been told, but we're just looking at it in different uh, packaging. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's still in extremely compelling, especially since, uh, you know, Ned dies and you are watching the power deplete. And like you said, you're just going through horrendous obstacle after horrendous obstacle, but ultimately um, 
the Starks and the Lannisters are at each other's throats. Mm-hmm. I mean, it is this. It is their story, and Khaleesi, to a degree, um, but I think she and like the white, uh, what are they, the white writers? I want to say, but that's not it. Uh, uh, right, the, the zombies. Yeah, I think they provide tension uh, more than anything. You know, you have essentially mythical creatures with her <coughs> from the south. Uh, and then you have mythical creatures coming in from the north over the wall. Um, and they create this kind of, this sen- at least for me, they created the sense that those are like the elements of nature, uh, you know, like earth, wind, and fire. It's this, it's death um, or it's uh, rampant life pressing in. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and so... <clears throat> What's going to happen with Ned? What or with the Starks? And uh, essentially, you have like two Stark children left, three, um, and one of them is a cripple. And then you have this extremely powerful, fully functioning, but rotting away from the inside Lannister family. Mm-hmm. And you're going to find out uh, either. Uh, Littlefinger is just going to totally subvert something so completely that he takes the throne um, and the Starks have been so wiped out that there's nothing but a unified land. Uh, Or you're going to have the Starks end up with it. Or dude is just totally cynical and nihilistic and, and, uh, you know, uh, Khaleesi just comes in and takes everything away from everybody and puts the world back in this well, totally yeah, subjective. I mean, she has a legitimate claim on the throne because Robert, sure. you know, the when the, first of all, you know, it's revealed, hey, look, <coughs> they make a shift in season three of making Jamie sympathetic. And it's like really? all of a sudden he's he's he he makes a couple of like noble moves and then he explains um that he uh, he killed the Mad King because the Mad King had instructed him to go out and kill the entire city of women and children and you know all these things. And it's like, oh, you know, he's the Kingslayer, but it was because he had had enough of his horrible, horrible orders. And right. you know, like, well, if you believe that, then it be it's good that they lost their their family hold on on the the line, but they had. The Targaryens had held the kingdom forever, and she's a Targaryen. So, like, she has dragons. She kind of belongs in charge. (coughs) Baratheons were usurpers. Lannisters would also be usurpers, even though they're currently, you know, among the most powerful people. Um, the, The greatest moment in season three for me was when, uh, Varys, the bald eunuch, yeah, um, I enjoy his character. I do too. Oh man, and he has a moment. Oh my gosh, he has a moment. Yeah. um, Where somebody's in talking to him um, about wanting. Oh, it's Tyrion. Come in. It comes in saying, "I need to know if my sister tried to kill me." And basically, he gives this long speech. Um, it's kind of like revenge is a dish best served cold, but he's telling the story about how he lost his balls and, (laughs) um, you know, he's a child and he gets sold from this group to this group. And then this guy eunuchs him and, 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 you know, he was, uh, blah, blah, blah. And this whole time he's like Tyrion standing next to what looks like a table that (coughs) Varys, Oh, hang on, hang on. Are you still there? Yeah. Okay, um, you know that 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 Varys is kind of wandering around. He's got uh, it looks like he's like a pry bar, and he's working around it. And and it's this long, long story um, about about his history and and this ho- horrible guy that was you know horrible to him. And then it moved on, and he talks about you know, I mean, the first twenty percent of the story is the horrible beginnings, and then the rest of the story is him like moving on and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you forget about the horribleness by the end, but he's like, you know, so it had a really horrible start, but I was able to use that 
um, to my advantage to get where I am today. And then he turns out it's not a table, it's a box. And at the very end, he cracks it open, and inside is a man chained. And it's the guy. No that, kidding. Yes, and it's just like, oh my god! Like, it's, it's the most... He's just he's just barely keeping the guy alive so he can torture him, and it's it's wow. what I'm like you put in the time and the work, and you will have your revenge, like, <laughs> and it's it's amazing, um, but that is is not my favorite moment. My favorite moment is he's walking outside talking with maybe it's um it's the girl that's gonna marry Joffrey. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And. And he's talking about Littlefinger because Littlefinger is talking about maybe trying to marry Sa- Sancha or whatever her name is. Yeah. Um, and the Stark girl. He's he's laying out like this guy came from nothing, and he just got gifted a castle and property. He's not gonna stop. And basically, the line the is Littlefinger. Yeah. Yeah. But Varys yeah. is basically talking about him. And the line is um, he'd see the whole world burned just so he could be king of the ashes. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. What an amazing line. I mean, never have fewer words told you so much about what's inside of a character and give you hints as to just what he will do. And, I mean, that line itself makes me want to continue watching the show. Really? Yeah. Just to Dude. see <clears throat> yeah. what, you know, because I love the idea of a of a story told over the course of 40 years, you know, and j- just how much can change. And, and, and if a person had the vision to enact the things early that would build and lead to what they eventually wanted 40 years after the fact, that is intriguing to me. And so... I'll stick with it because I want to see where they're going. But ultimately, if it's uh, might makes right, and everybody that I like dies, and the end, that's going to be frustrating. So yeah, when uh, are we still, man? Are we still live? I wasn't. Oh, uh, actually, I think we are. So we can. Oh, <laughs> we can actually take this audio and make it make it the B side. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So. When Rob gets shot, and then Cat gets shot, yeah. Thoughts. I mean, well, like, was it no, just gut wrenching, or were you like, no? Well, they did this. Well, from I had, I knew something had happened. I saw some of the Twitter stuff. I didn't know what it was. I just knew. Look, we're at a wedding. Something tragic happens, and so I was sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. And the way it happens, Mike is, and I knew, I had a feeling they were going to kill her off. Um, Well, they were going to kill off Rob's wife because they make her pregnant and, oh, they're going to name him Ned. And it's like they're building us up to feel like a loss. So the whole sequence starts when Kat looks down at, I think, a relative of hers and sees that he's got armor on underneath his clothes and then he gets up and, and walks out, and a guy comes in and reaches around Rob Stark's wife and stabs her ten times right in the baby. Oh, and um, did Carrie see that? Yeah. What was it? Did it just wreck her? Uh, and, uh, she she can turn off and get disengaged, but I think it 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 the whole scene you know it, it affected us for a couple days. Um, and then the crossbows come out and everybody just starts, you know, getting killed by the sword and Rob's got a bunch of arrows in him and then he's crawling over to his dead wife and, and then Cat grabs Lord Frey's wife and holds a right. knife to her throat and says, I'll, you know, we will be loyal to you. Just let him live. Um, you know, I'll, you know, I'll kill your wife. And he's like, ah, I'll get another. And, uh, and so, and then they shoot Rob again. No, no, no. Then her relative comes in and just like slices his midsection open, and and so then it's this weird sort of slightly slow mo, you know, remove thing. They just show Cat like slit the girl's throat, 
She knows she's. It's, that's right. a we, that's the weird choice. Is like I'm gonna die. This threat didn't work, but I'll follow through with my threat. So she slits the girl's throat, and then this guy comes and slits her open. And as she's like gushing blood out of the slit in her neck, the show ends. Yeah, I remember reading it, and uh, it kind of jumps into what she's thinking when she dies, mm. and uh, there is like a white hot passion when she sees Rob die mm. and she just flies off and ki- it's like I'll just kill whatever because uh-huh. you killed my kid mm-hmm. so yeah <clears throat> I think I remember reading that and just being kind of sick so yeah I mean the whole the whole series has kind of threaded the needle with that when you just been disturbed like yeah. there's a lot of disturbing scenes and whatnot, but definitely. Yeah, I remember when they died; it was tough. Yeah, and I mean, because they are set up as like, hey, you know, this guy is Ned Stark's kid. They have a claim to the throne. Go for it. Um, and he's and, like a good leader, and he's positive, right? Influence on everybody and all that, right? And. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's definitely I don't know. It's a cross between who would people most be pissed if we killed, and look, we have this overarching story, um, and this really dramatizes that overarching story. You know, like it's going to be much more satisfying when Arya kills Joffrey, because I feel like. Bran's going to play a big role, but I mean, I don't think they're done killing Starks. I think they'll make Bran into a big, big, big deal and then have him die. Um, I, I don't know if they'll do anything with the little kid or not, but I really feel like they've got to leave. Maybe Arya and Bran get together and do something, but they've got to essentially get Joffrey. Or <clears throat> Because is there any other justice than killing Joffrey for killing their dad? It's, I mean... You know, defeating the Lannisters is almost secondary to killing Joffrey. Yeah, I think the ultimate justice is having him proclaimed a, uh, or is, you know, having his name cleared. Uh, right, right. Killing right. Joffrey isn't necessarily, it's so uh, cathartic for us because we hate Joffrey. Right. Uh, but it's, for them, in the passion, it's, in the passion of the moment, it's, it's definitely the first thing, but I think having themselves cleared is bigger. Sorry, if I'm talking weird, there's a the whole echo going on, and it's, oh, I sorry. can hear myself after I say it. I, yeah, it's yeah. freaking me out. All right. Well, so anyway, that's that's that. I don't know. Now, do you know what happens in the rest of that book? That that third the book? Fourth one? The third one. Because the events um, we're talking about are apparently in the middle of the third one. Right. I need to brush up Um, because off off the top of my head, the biggest thing was the Starks in the wedding murder. Right. Yeah. (coughs) Excuse me. Yeah. I'm curious how they're going to finish the season. Like that would have made sense to end the season that way. So I'm I'm, I'm curious to see what they'll do tomorrow because they come out on Sunday, don't they? Yep. Well, and here's the other thing. Um, there are a couple more plot points that I'm aware of that are significant and and uh, impact characters that we like. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not exactly sure when they happen. I want to say it's this book, but it may not be uh, till the end, so it may not be till next season. Uh, right. But it may also be the fourth, so I'm not entirely sure. That someone else is going to die. Somebody that you like. Well, yeah. well and I that wouldn't was, say that. That was the other thing. The, uh, Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, <coughs> it has to do with Joffrey, and then uh, there is, uh, I don't know if you remember, but early on in the second season, um, uh Oh, I can't think. Tyrion's sister accused him of like uh, conspiracy. Do you remember that? Yeah. Um, 
and it's it's a more severe thing of that and Tyrion almost gets ostracized i think but there's okay. there's some serious significant in, uh, things that happen in that family okay so um and y- because you like Tyrion, it's one of the characters that you like which is right. you know kudos I mean, to martin for making a lannister that anybody likes right as well but now he's shifting and trying to make jamie somebody that you care about and like right um, but Tyrion is obviously somebody who has a, a decent like core um john snow but then they have at the end of this episode as well they have john snow you know he's with egret and um she's basically said i I fight for you you fight for me so like (coughs) no matter what happens we don't leave each other and then he gets exposed for still being a night's watchman and right hightails it leaves her even after she like fought her own people for him, he takes off without her, which means he set himself up to, like, you know, like, hell hath no fury, like a woman scorned. Like, th- that's exactly. bad news, and it's, not, it's a dick move, too. Like, he should have grabbed her and gotten out of there. Um, so now you even see somebody that you like doing something sort of dishonorable. And, uh, right. um, but, you know, obviously you like Bran, you like Arya, you like Tyrion, they're it. Because, uh, honestly, how do you feel about Khaleesi at this point? Well, I guess I've come around to to like her. I I love her um, Jura, uh, her you know second right, in command. Right. I I I love him. Um, <clears throat> but now there's she has a new love interest who's this big fighter dude um, that kills two other people and brings her their heads and anyway. Um, I you know I like her. I, I'm more interested. Ultimately, I don't care who sits on the throne at the end. You know what I mean? Like I I want right. to know how does the Stark family get justice, um, and what does it mean that winter is coming? Those are my things. Oh, right. And right. and what's going to happen with Littlefinger? <laughs> yeah. Um, have they really kind of explained the uh, weather cycles? in this realm not really just that like when winter comes it comes for years and years and years it'll be years of winter yeah, so and then it's bad news and that the white walkers can probably like descend past the wall in that time right so the winter season is like i mean their seasons are extremely extended right um in the winter season i think f- for some reason i forget off the top of my head but um the fact that it's prolonged and that it's it can be so severe i mean like you'll have generations that live and die without ever seeing a summer right 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 um, and that it can be so severe that people uh i mean just the snow size is is supposed to be enormous and that was one of the things that lisa was like wow that's pretty cool the idea you know those mm-hmm. kind of ideas being thrown around right. so you know fantastical elements but still Having an impact is pretty cool. All right, dude. <laughs> All right, We're dude. Wrap it up here. Good talk. Uh, those of you checking out the YouTube broadcast, good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would like to see where this is on YouTube. Like somebody, do you somebody has on already commented on this podcast on the YouTube video? And their comment no was kidding. their comment was WTF. <laughs> So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but uh, uh, WTF to you as well. Um, and yeah. thanks for your comment. Right. Uh, this concludes our live broadcast. Uh, pip pip cheerio. <laughs>